Coming out on uh, what was a beautiful day and it's still a pretty warm evening. My name, I think you know, is Brent Rathgaber and I'm the independent incumbent candidate in uh, St. Albert Edmonton. And I'm uh, so pleased to be joined, first of all, by so many supporters and secondly by two very, very special guests. One I did not know was coming, but I'm so glad to see Master Corporal Paul Franklin. Hey, hey. 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 Audra Dorn with me in 2011 and she's so upset that living in Greece while she won't be able to vote for me this time around. <laughs> well, we're here to talk about Veterans Affairs and I think Paul's story is really quite telling. I mean, Paul is obviously severely, severely injured as a result of uh, his service to his country. And every year, Veterans Affairs forces him to re-establish his permanent disability. Now, if that isn't, if that isn't adding insult to injury and insensitivity to one of our bravest heroes, I don't know what is. Paul, did you want to say a couple words? Um, yeah, he's uh, Brent's always been a supporter of us and the vets and the community. So, um, just to, just to say very quickly that um, you guys have a, a very great representative here, and I just want you to uh, vote for him and to encourage others to do the same. And uh, the end result, you'll see in the community. And also with us veterans. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your service and your sacrifice to your country. Now we're gathered here very close to the St. Albert Cenotaph, where in less than one month we will honor all of the brave men and women who have paid the ultimate price in service to their country. And that is important, but it is equally important to take care of those veterans who also have served and made sacrifices but thankfully are still with us. And I'm honored and, ple and pleased and humbled that Colonel Pat Stogren has uh, been hanging out with us for the last 36 hours and we've done a lot of events. You've done a lot of media. You were awesome on 6.30 chat this morning. Pat uh, lived in St. Albert, lived in Deer Ridge when he, when he was head of uh, the Princess Patricia Canadian Light Infantry. And he served one tour in Afghanistan. And as, and as impressive as his military resume is, my greatest and deepest respect for Pat is what he did after he left the military. He was appointed as the first veterans ombudsman. And as a veterans ombudsman, his job was to advocate on behalf of veterans. But sometimes success has its own problems. And Pat was a problem of his own success because he got under the skin of the Harper government by doing his job too, too well. And as a result, when his three-year appointment came up for renewal, guess what? They said, thank you, but uh, have a good life. So Pat has continued. Well, they didn't even say that, Brent. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they said, don't let the ad go. Let the go. Let the go. Let the go. <laughs> so Pat and I uh, have become friends over the last six months. Um, we believe that Parliament and parliamentary and government watchdogs ought to be watchdogs, not lapdogs and cheerleaders. But the problem with the current government and the former government before that, because the Veterans Charter was not passed by the current government, it was passed by the Liberal government. But those of us who are in a position to keep our eyes on government and on bureaucracies and on ministers shouldn't be punished for doing our job and holding government to account and making ministers answer tough questions. But Pat was very good at his job, so they decided uh, not to renew his contract, but he continues to advocate on behalf of veterans. He has strong uh, positions with respect to the state of our democracy, which are very similar to my uh, feelings about the party system being much too strong and individual representatives sacrificing their constituents the moment they're sworn in and becoming nothing other than the mouthpiece for their respective parties. So he's uh, here to, uh, to bring his message and his advocacy both on behalf of veterans and also on behalf of a better democracy. And I'm so pleased that you took time out of your schedule to come here and say a few words to these supporters. Right Without further ado, Retainer Colonel Pat Stobrin. Oh, Colonel, not one. Retired Colonel. Retired old Colonel. Sorry, I'm not as tall as Brent, so I'm going to stand up on here. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. First of all, thank you so much for coming out tonight, folks. Really appreciate it. I'm really disappointed in a lot of the reprobates that I served with. Shane, so pass that on when uh, 
you know, not many of the old 3rd Battalion crew here, but uh, no, thank you very much. To me, this is not so much about veterans, although, you know, of course, veterans are very, very near and dear to me. Just by way of background, when I joined the military, I only joined to get a degree in electrical engineering. I wanted to become a rich businessman. I hated every second that I was in military college. I had every intention of getting out after my four compulsory years, but when I joined 3rd Battalion Patricia's in Victoria, I fell in love with the Army. I loved jumping out of airplanes. I loved shooting guns. I loved the physical stuff. I'm always in for a fight, and most of all, I love the people that I was serving with, these real genuine Canadians. So as a young man, I decided, hey, I want to command a battalion. And I got to command a battalion, and I spent my entire adult life trying to learn what it takes to be a leader. And I had a steep hill to climb to become a leader, right, Shane? I, I, I had some rough edges that guys like Shane, Shane Schreiber, by the way, was one of my commanders in Afghanistan in 2002. And that was the high water mark for me. We went over there and we were basically pulled out of uh, the garrison here at very short notice. Rapid reaction and the men and women, I'll never forget the day when I was reading them the orders, you know. And we were in the 3rd Battalion that was slated for disbandment. And I was reading them the orders, we called them back early after Christmas and my hands were shaking and I felt like a wimp because I thought I was going to start crying, I was so excited. And you, the old man just doesn't cry in front of the troops. But I remember I re we were going on a combat mission. Like, I'm, a, I'm sorry, I didn't tear up now. That's the PTSD of me now. <laughs> I remember tearing up, and I look up and down the file, and I see all these young troopers. Eh? We were going to be disbanded. The 3rd Battalion was the reincarnation of the Airborne Regiment. We were hated, but we were going to war. And I just look at these young troops with their berets pulled down, and they just got this steel stare in their eyes and a little bit of a smirk like we're good for this and you know we went there and we made history I was a pariah then as I am a pariah now and uh, I was really destined for nowhere in the military because this was my high water mark but I gotta say troops made me look good it was it was a team effort and I've never served with a better team than that when I came home Having reached my high water mark in my career, I didn't know what I was going to do as adult pop. Like, I grew up in the military, so I decided I would dig in for my family. Spent a couple of years kicking around in Ottawa, and the chance came to be the Veterans Ombudsman, and I'll tell you, by that point in time, I was disgusted with Afghanistan. I didn't want to be a part of it because I knew it was destined for failure. And I saw these young, courageous troops, many of whom I had served with, went back for two and three tours, you know, and Paul Franklin was there, and yep. this is when it heated up, because the bad guys had sorted out their act, and they came back with a vengeance. But we were fighting Afghanistan like Vietnam all over again, so as a colonel, I had a gut full of this, and I wanted to step away. I was becoming more of a pariah, because I was outspoken at National Defense Headquarters, and I was offered this job as Veterans Army, and I saw this as a chance for me to step gracefully out of the military and to give back to the troops. So, the mistake I made was, I thought the government wanted me to fix things. So I threw my heart and soul into it. And put myself in the trenches and toured this country, uh, the homeless shelters, the long-term care facilities, the hospitals, every chance I could get to talk to veterans. And I was promised by the minister, by two ministers, that I could be the squeaky wheel and I could fix things, you know. And, and I didn't need a strong mandate because who would disadvantage our veterans? So old, stupid Stoker here saluted and went off to try and fix things. Two years into my mandate, I didn't think I was going to get a second term. So I had a year left and I decided I'd throw the marker down. So I went into the deputy minister and I said, remember all those promises you're making me about how you're going to fix things for veterans? I said, okay, here's the first one I want to hit. Too easy. It was they're cheating some Second World War vet, uh, uh, widows. Okay, and so this was chump change. You can fix it. And the deputy minister looks at me across the table and says, Pat, I can't go to Treasury Board and ask for more money for veterans. And I said, I beg your pardon? Weren't you telling me that we're working together here and you know, I'm going to facilitate you making things better for the veterans? You lied to me. And I decided then and there I was going low. I didn't know how or where or what the trigger was, but they made it easy for me because unlike the other commissioners and, and uh, people, that, the watchdogs, where the government let their, their term expire, they told me I wasn't getting a second term. So I called in my A-team and I said, guys, I'm going to war. You guys run the Ombudsman's office, but I'm going to tell Canadians how morally bankrupt this government is. The government. Because I'll tell you something, folks. 
it's not just the parliamentarians. There is a secret society out there of senior bureaucrats who, uh, it's like a symbiotic relationship of two mob bosses. The government of the day and the senior bureaucrats, and they work together. And as long as you don't step into one or the other's thing, they'll work together and they'll deceive you. Know, I saw deception that I would have thought in my younger days was something that manifested itself over only in the Soviet Union. But no, they were lying to Canadians. And I would go in and I'd call the minister. Homeless veterans was my first marker that I threw down. And I intercepted a, a memo to cabinet and it wasn't it wasn't done covertly they just indiscriminately sent it to me and they they were listing for the minister all of the great things that they do for homeless veterans they didn't even know they were homeless veterans when i arrived at true story but they listed things like veterans independence program so in home care vet, homeless veterans are entitled to groundskeeping and in homes care in home care that's how ridiculous it was so i contacted the minister minister thompson i said sir that, that is an exaggeration bordering on a lie, and I prefer you didn't say that because I'm not going to support it. That was the beginning of the end for me. It just got worse. I've spent almost two years of my life in war zones. A year and a half in Bosnia and then six months with the troops in, in Afghanistan. And I, I was diagnosed from, with PTSD from the first time, but I've always been a psychological mess. So that's, you know, water under the bridge. But I'll tell you something, nothing has ever been more traumatizing for me than to see how our government deliberately cheats veterans. And I'll tell you something, folks, this isn't about politics. I'm here because in my remake, check out the rebelgorilla.com, and that's the big hairy 800 pound gorilla who people listen to when he or she talks. I'm here to talk about leadership. Because what I saw in Ottawa, first of all, in the army and the military, senior ranks, I, I don't refer to senior leadership in the Canadian forces anymore. It's senior management. There was no leadership there. We knew we weren't going to be successful. I came here because Brent is one of the only principled people that I have ever met in Ottawa. Resigning on principle based on the transparency, transparency legislation that he tried to push through. You know, I, I, I've been quoted many times as saying that deputy ministers make more in one year than they offer triple amputees in terms of compensation. And they were scrambling to try and, and sort that thing out. While I was in office, and they're, they're making all these big promises, I don't know how many billions of dollars these politicians, they say they've spent on veterans. No, they make promises. The problem is, is the bureaucracy doesn't want to spend it. Since 2006, they sent back, and we were tracking this, we knew that, and I confronted the deputy minister, they sent back over a billion dollars that should have gone into the pockets of our veterans. I couldn't stomach that. My time as ombudsman was more traumatic and I was more messed up after that than a year and a half in Bosnia and six months with the troops in Afghanistan. It was that terrible. I was angry for four years. I, I wrote a book, it's coming out in November, it's Rude Awakening, it, it chronicles my uh, first person singular, my experience with these reprobates. So look for it on your bookshelf and it makes an excellent Christmas gift also. <laughs> But I chronicled it, and I gotta say, it's about 90,000 words, I wrote 500,000 words. I was so angry, I'd sit down and write every day. So bad, that I couldn't get an editor to touch it. One editor said, Pat, when I read the first page, it was like you were yelling at me. So I spent two years editing it to get all the anger and the, the rants and all that out of it so I could tell my story. So, a little bit therapeutic. Now I'm here. I could have started a charity and done something magnificent like like Paul's doing, uh, but instead I'm, I'm a warfighter and I'm starting a revolution in Canada. Now if we're in the southern hemisphere, I'd be handing out pitchforks and torches to you now, but I want to start a revolution in the democratic affairs of this country. And I came up with this idea. The problem is our parties. Okay, I had members of the caucus that Brent resigned from after committee meetings meeting me out in the hall saying, Pat, you know, I wish there was more I could do for you as a member of the Conservative Party. But they couldn't because they were told what they could and couldn't. I was disgusted in that. Get some kahunas. People's lives are at stake here. So I came away from it and I said, how can I really disrupt things? And I recognized that the problem are these corporate political parties. You know, they, these leaders who whip their caucuses and don't listen 
to their members, uh, to the, their constituencies. So it really resonated when Brent resigned. And irresponsible government, also available in the bookstores. It's also good for Christmas dress. Great gift. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's old news, so you gotta look at it. <laughs> but no, it, it's resonated so much with me. I said, I'm gonna push independent candidates. So I started pushing. I think he's the icon. I'm going off to Prince George, and, and I don't have enough money to go to the West Coast or the East Coast to, to present this, but I believe this is leadership, you know. If you look at my Rebel Guerrilla website, I talk about things like leadership possess the skills of critical thinking and creative thinking, you know. They can't blindly accept the status quo. They can't go with conventional wisdom. They've got to think for themselves, eliminate their biases, and use creativity so that we win wars, we don't lose them. And I don't mean just, I'm speaking rhetorically here, so that we make this country a better place. I am a huge fan of Brent and the concept of independent candidates. I think if we can get enough strong-willed, critical thinkers who are truly committed to the people of their constituents, we're going to turn a corner in, in Ottawa. And it's not just one party that's guilty. It's been a continuum from the old days. You know, every government has done the, the Liberal government introduced the new Veterans Charter. So, you know, Brent, I want to wish you the best of luck. I wish there were more Patricias out here. Uh, Apollo Rock Assigns. I'll talk to the RSM tomorrow. But um, I, I want to wish you the best of luck. I hope you all get behind him. I, I think you guys are going to make history. And I would like to think that Brent is going to be the thin edge of the wedge to break that stranglehold, to, to, to open up that culture in Ottawa so that our government starts listening to the people again. So best of luck to you. Best of luck to all of you. I'm, uh, I'm a no it's nice to be back home to St. Albert, but you know, I was away so much with the third to die and I really don't know this place. My family <laughs> loved it. But, uh, it's, I, I just was being driven around by Brent here and I said, wow, I would have liked to have lived here. <laughs> <laughs> We're going in here to have something to eat. And uh, so here ends the speech. I could go on for hours. Trust me, right, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would like to, you know, engage in dialogues there as much as I like to shoot off my mouth and stand up high. I, I would love to engage in one-on-ones and tell you some some war stories and tell you where you can buy that book. So, uh, uh, good luck. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for those kind words. And thank all of you for coming out and listening to this message. We're only uh, three sleeps away from the big day. It's going to be a really, really tight election. Nationally, it's going to be even a tighter election here in St. Albert Edmonton. Every seat counts, every vote counts. It's going to be a minority parliament. If you can send me back there, um, I think I, I was an effective representative as in a majority parliament. I know that I can be much stronger in a minority where my vote and my input will be sought after by whoever the government is of the day. So thank you so much. Thank you for supporting our veterans. We're going to go next door and uh, get something warm to eat, and you're all welcome. And thank you so much for your support. Good night. It's all on brand. <laughs>